Good morning, everyone. I can only assume that this is as much a treat for you as it is for me. This is a huge day as both a finance nerd, a longtime sci-fi reader, and brand new investor. Thank you both for allowing me to moderate this brief conversation with you. Um, so I want to jump in. I'm going to start with Stan and ask sort of the origin story question. How did this concept of the carbon coin come to your attention, but more importantly, end up in your book as such a powerful exercise in the way that finance can affect major change? Well, I am a utopian science fiction writer, and it's an odd thing. Um, and I wanted to write a novel that put all my cards on the table and described the, the next um, half century going well. It's a difficult situation that we're in, and uh, my bar for success has gotten lower as the decades have passed. If we dodge a mass extinction event, that's a utopian outcome at this point. And I think it can be done, and I, you can see the technical solutions are out there. Uh, many of you represent and are working on the technical solutions. And what occurred to me was we don't have a good way to pay for them. That capital, investment capital goes to the highest rate of return. The highest rate of return is poorly calculated for long-term biosphere health, among other problems with it. And so I began to look around. Well, how could you get people to... Um, pay for the necessary work to decarbonize the world quickly and um, in, encourage biosphere health all around. So uh, I've ran into a paper, a Hypothesis for a Risk Cost for Carbon, um, by a Delton Chen. It was online, a Springer Verlog article, and it described um, a method by which the, the central banks essentially did a kind of quantitative, quantitative easing, you might say, um, that was carbon quantitative easing that was directed towards good, green, biosphere-healthy, decarbonizing projects that you, um, the initial creation of the money by the central banks would be paid first for those. This was what I took out of Delton's paper. I based the the entire plot of the Ministry for the Future, or the major plot, was based on the idea that a a Minister for the Future, a UN functionary, convinced the leaders of the central banks to indeed uh, adopt and, and deploy that program. And I believe very strongly that this is one of the reasons why my novel has been taken up with such enthusiasm over the last couple of years. It seems to suggest that there's a viable plan that that it could be done, that it could be paid for, and that we could squeak by. And people want that story. And then Dr. Chen, Delton, welcome. When did you find out that your idea had been adapted in this way? How did it feel and what has it led to since? Because now it's a movement. Well, I heard about uh, Stan's novel in writing in 2019 when he contacted me. He asked me to do a review. So he had written the manuscript and my job was to check it, basically. And I did that. It was um, a very interesting process, a very thick book, by the way. So it was a lot of work, but I enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> and he didn't pay you at all, did he? I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes. It, it was a bit of... He's in the acknowledgments. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit of a surprise to be dealing with science fiction novel, but in reality, when you develop a policy, it's storytelling. It's economic storytelling, it's political storytelling, and indeed the, the genesis of the policy uh, way before I met Stan was storytelling to discover how to use a, a currency, that's a parallel currency, to resolve the free rider problem. So the key point here is about a currency, carbon currency, or carbon coin in the novel, is that it's a mechanism that is untapped Economists aren't really thinking about it or talking about it, mm -hmm. and it's so powerful because it's a way of funding at speed and scale climate mitigation uh, through monetary policy that avoids creating more debt. And by avoiding debt, by avoiding directly charging citizens, businesses and governments, I think it will solicit 
much more cooperation. It's about uh, attacking that free rider problem, providing funding at speed and scale. We're talking trillions, mm -hmm. at least three trillion, maybe four or five trillion. Think about carbon dioxide removal. That's a big bill. We're talking over a trillion. And so uh, this whole idea hasn't really been explored. And it, it, it connects with other ideas too, such as decentralization, the ability to use blockchains, if you really love blockchains, and uh, collecting information from markets and sharing it back. So there's a lot going on here that hasn't been explored. Yeah. How did you come to this, by the way? Are you an economist by training? Sort of explain how you arrived to be the guy who wrote the paper. I call myself an interdisciplinary an analyst. Because an interdisciplinary yes. analyst. I'm stealing that. I'm not an <laughs> economist by training. I'm an engineer by training. My confidence in this comes from problem solving. So I'm used to looking at complex problems, trying to find solutions, and where I begin is the conceptual model. And I was suspicious that the standard economic model was missing some concepts because uh, we, we have so many problems in the economy, don't we? Uh, for example, carbon markets are somewhat dysfunctional. We don't have the scalable funding for carbon removal. Economists are still debating time discounting. These are unsolved riddles and puzzles. Mm -hmm. So something's not quite right there. Um, Stan, it has been a through line in many of your novels, some exploration of capitalism. New York 2140 got more explicit in bringing in the idea of the global financial system. And then, of course, Ministry for the Future proposes this method of paying for things. It, it's an interesting, this, you're explicitly at the intersection, both of you, with this concept of capitalism and climate change at a time when activists are chaining themselves to banks. You know, to talk about sort of the the power of finance and, and what has led you to these both, I think, to these realizations that this is this is a mechanism for real change in a capitalist world. Well, it is a capitalist world, and I I speak as a an old hippie leftist, uh, the Vietnam era uh, uh, eco socialist at heart, but it is a capitalist world, and we're in an emergency decade, and so I now regard. Keynesian stimulus, Keynesian politics and the political economy as the, f the most effective, the most socially just method that we can deploy right now. So I would regard Dalton's plan as a targeted kind of Keynesian stimulus. And I use the analogy now, it's, it's not a good analogy, but it's uh, stimulating for thought. In World War II, the governments of the Allied powers took over the economies of their country in order to save themselves. The British Treasury took over the, the Bank of England and, and uh, what was partly private uh, capital was put entirely and trained by governments to um, solve a pressing existential problem. Well, now the whole world has a pressing existential problem, which is um, climate change and mass extinction event. Um, we're in a capitalist world and it, it needs to be a public-private partnership. The actual work will be done by a lot of private corporations, but the payment for them may need to be directed by and even uh, uh, paid for in the first place by government. Uh, so this is Keynesian rather than neoliberal market ascendancy. It's not the hugest shift in the world, but I feel like for the sake of expediency, of actually doing it, of getting political support and legislative support, that this is the best thing I could think of. And so for me, um, Delton's plan, which is to say, let's make a kind of carbon standard, the way there used to be a gold standard, and uh, units of carbon are are effectively the the underpinning, the infrastructural underpinning of our economy. Let's use that as our unit of exchange and of value. That struck me as powerful. And it was a step beyond New York 2140 where I was proposing that we basically nationalize the banks and direct their investments as a public thing. Well, the national banks already exist. They're central banks. So that led me along this next step. Yeah. Do you want to pick up on this thread a little bit and how you see these things intersecting? 
A little, yes. There is a debate. A lot is okay. There, there are these debates between socialism and capitalism as two models. I think that's a false dichotomy. There's another debate which is a bit similar between green growth and degrowth. Mm -hmm. I think that's another false dichotomy. The model that we're putting forward is different because it's about introducing a parallel economy, a complementary economy, call it the mitigation economy with this carbon currency. And so what we end up with is two systems working together in a kind of symbiosis where resources are transferred from this consumptive mainstream economy with the fiat money and the debt into a, a debt-free economy. And this approach, which is macroeconomic, can rebalance uh, our unsustainability with uh, a new economy that would fund all of the work that people here are trying to progress and advance. So I, that's where I think we should uh, explore new ideas. And now you're working on this with Global Carbon Reward, the organization. Tell us about the kind of status of the project. And I should note here that there will be a breakout session this afternoon where we're going to explore this topic in a little bit more depth that is obviously a fairly sophisticated financial concept. We'll get into some of those details later, but tell us for the moment kind of the status of the project and what it would take to get this to reality. Quite a lot of global financial cooperation. Well, Molly, this project has been in stealth mode for eight years, maybe more. And uh, I'm not exaggerating. Many of us in our team only met physically today uh, and this week. So uh, I I'm pleased to report that we have a fantastic team, uh, interdisciplinary. We have banker, economist, people familiar with renewable energy projects and climate policy. And we have a strategic plan, which is to raise uh, the support we need, strategic partners, raise some money to undertake a policy demonstration. So our policy demonstration will take about three years and it's designed to engage with stakeholders, in particular the decision makers in business who will be asked to mitigate quickly for the reward. Mm -hmm. And this includes all businesses, including uh, the fossil fuel sector, all, as, all, all businesses in you know, the consumptive economy, and we're also going to engage with experts in central banking, economics, and also uh, community, ecologists, scientists, because our policy is broad enough that it can engage with all of these stakeholders. This is social science. We're not going to uh, build a currency straight away, but the idea is to map uh, the views and opinions to get that feedback so we can understand if this policy can trigger an exponential response that we need. And Stan, certainly as a science fiction writer, you must be familiar with the occasions on which the things you've written come true. How, do, how does this feel for you to have adapted this research? And I don't know, I mean, the Mars trilogy felt like to me like reading a history of the colonization of Mars in some cases, but how does it feel to you to have adapted and advanced this and now, you know, see it potentially develop into a solution? Is it hopeful? Well, it's it's personally gratifying, but it also is a little bit uh, terrifying in this. What I've seen, it's almost exactly two years since Ministry for the Future came out, and it's had a big response, and it's partly because of the practical plan that I adapted from Delton's work. But it's also because I portrayed the next 30 years going well despite chaos, defeats, disorder, things going wrong, th people working hard to oppose decarbonization and the saving of the biosphere, making it their life project to wreck that project of saving the biosphere. All that's going to happen, and yet the story tells um, eventually comes out with us having squeaked through and the hunger that people have for that story being told is what I've noticed in, in in the last two years has been extraordinary and people definitely want to uh, 
hear that story, believe in this story, which is of course a kicker because it's a utopian story that you can dismiss, oh that won't happen, but people want it to be true, and then they work for the various parts of it, which I take it is really what this meeting is about. Everybody is one brick and a wall, the one project can do it alone and there's going to be resistance to it and difficulties and it's hard to get it paid for but if all of this was to come together then the the possibilities are real and are important to uh, work for so uh, I'm I'm I feel like it should be a uh, I don't know, a, a genre in itself. Utopia should be a genre. It is a genre. It's one of the smallest genres in on Amazon.com. <laughs> Always has been. You can count them on the fingers of two hands in the whole history since Sir Thomas More, almost. But people want that story in order to uh, orient themselves and give themselves a cognitive map for life. Um, as they go forward. In other words, what you do in the present, you're always a science fiction writer for yourself. You have the utopian side, if I do these things, things will go well. And you have the dystopian side, middle of the night, you wake up worried and thinking, oh my gosh, everything could crash. And, you know, on the individual level, that's actually physically true someday. So dystopia is very strong. Utopia is also very strong. Well, and we talked about this once before. It's a, it's a utopia that's grounded. It, I think I called it the optimism of hard work. It's yeah. utopia grounded in very complicated concepts in social science that takes years to put together. Um, but when you look at the impact that this story has had, Delta, and you must think this is achievable. I think it is. Uh, we're in a special time now. The world recognizes we're in a climate crisis. What's at stake is the planetary biosphere and God knows what else. So um, to sum up, I would say we could look at our situation as a glass half empty or a glass half full. When I look at the situation, I see central banks, I see the network for green financial system, I see all this marvelous new technology, the internet, uh, central bank digital currencies and so on. It's all there. Mm -hmm. What we're missing is the story for how it all fits together to provide the finance to resolve these economic problems we have with funding, carbon removal and, and conventional mitigation at speed and scale. I think it can be done. We just need to have clarity in the economics and the concepts to support it and advance it at the right time. Yeah. Well, if you would like a little more of that clarity, please join us for, again, a deep dive into this topic with these two and some other very smart panelists uh, this afternoon. Thank you so much, Kim Stanley Robinson, Dr. Delton Chen. What a pleasure. Thank you, Molly.